You're in the chat room with Virginia Trioli. And the chat room today is uh, decorated as you would imagine. Perhaps an orphanage might be in Venice in the 1700s. Now, I don't know if that's going to be particularly austere or, or maybe something a little more lovely because the Ospedale della Pietà back in the 1700s was an orphanage that developed an international reputation for concerts that were presented exclusively by the young women who were educated there. And the kind of people who taught there and who had an ongoing role at the Ospedale della Pietà were people like Antonio Vivaldi. And so that brings us to the story of Agatha della Pietà, to her lost manuscript, her composition in fragments of a cantata that was put together almost 300 years ago that is now going to be performed by the Australian Chamber Choir. Elizabeth Anderson is the manager of the Australian Chamber Choir and she reconstructed this full score of Agatha's cantata and she's with you this morning. Elizabeth, good morning. Hi, Virginia. Thanks for having me on your show. It's a delight to have you. And Douglas Lawrence is here as well, founder and director of the Australian Chamber Choir. And uh, as I mentioned, they're going to perform that cantata at the Scots Church this Saturday. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, yes, the following Saturday, May the 7th. Douglas, good to talk to you. Hello. Good morning. Nice so, to be here. Um, Elizabeth, take me back. How did you first learn about Agatha de la Pieta? Well, I imagine that there must have been some orphans who were composing or were interested in composition. Uh, way back when I was at school and I learned about Antonio Vivaldi and that he was a teacher in an orphanage, I thought, gosh, you know, if those girls were playing music at a professional level, some of them must have been composing. And, you know, back then it was just an idea. And then we decided on the Vivaldi Gloria as part of our 2022 um, series and I, that, that idea was reignited I thought well wow, let's just have a bit of a look I started googling it and I found um, where the library was that, the, that Agatha's fragments were held and I immediately wrote off to the librarian um, I, I did Italian at uni so I wrote in my best Italian and I got an answer <laughs> instantly yes, here's a list of all the fragments that we've got I was just overwhelmed um, and so I came back to her asking for advice because I couldn't look at all those fragments. I, I couldn't really even ask for all of them. So uh, I just asked for her advice as to which piece would there be the maximum number of fragments of that, that would be suitable for a reconstruction. She said, oh, definitely this one. And uh, pretty much the next day I had the manuscript copied in my inbox. Oh my goodness. And were you the first person, as, as far as you know, Elizabeth, who had asked for the fragments of her compositions and was now trying to put them together into a coherent piece? Yes. Her name's Sil Sylvia Aldabani in, in the Venice Conservatorium Library. She's the consultant librarian. And I've had a conversation backwards and forwards by email with her ever since. And she's confirmed that nobody else has borrowed the manuscripts. Nobody else has suggested that they were going to do a reconstruction. Mm. There have been no, no performances that she's aware of. So she's confirming that this is the world premiere. Well, congratulations <laughs> to, Thank to, you. to both I'm, of I'm you. Still surprised. <laughs> I'm still surprised myself. I can't, I can't quite believe it. I think we're going to have a sellout at the Scots Church, so I, I hope they're, <laughs> they're preparing themselves for it. Douglas Lawrence, this is a, a remarkable story. It certainly is. She's tenacious, that wife of mine. <laughs> <laughs> tell, tell us about the music itself. So I want to go back a little further and talk a little more about the Ospedale itself and about, of course, Vivaldi's work and his teaching and, and just why it became this extraordinary musical uh, institution. <clears throat> but the, the piece of music, Douglas, what, what challenges, if any, does it present for modern-day players? Okay. Um, probably most of your listeners... I've heard Vivaldi, I guess the Four Seasons is the most, probably the best well known of all classical pieces. Um, Vivaldi's very upfront, he's very aggressive, is not the right word, but mm. it's full of it, you know, it really goes very hard. This piece isn't like that, with one exception, that is the first, um, the first verse has a virtuosic, truly virtuosic violin 
solo. Jen Kirstner is the first violinist in this performance. And as I said in the, in the paper, I think most violinists would look at the score and turn, turn the page. <laughs> having said that... Why? why? Uh, give, give me an insight into why. Why would you turn the page? It's so difficult. It's really, really, really a, a, as hard as a violin solo of older music can be. Really? And it, it takes a, a very, very fine player to do that. Having said that, um, and if I'm allowed to use the word, I find the piece feminine in that men start wars, don't they? And the women don't. Um, it's, it's, it's assertive, but it's gentle. I'm not sure if you can be both, but I think you probably can. Uh, it's truly beautiful. It doesn't sound like Vivaldi, but it does sound like music of that period. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful piece of music. How would you um, characterise it, Elizabeth? Well, I think it does sound like Vivaldi. I'd start off by saying, <laughs> well, it sounds like Vivaldi, except... Um, and I'd like to also point out that that first violin part is completely written by Agatha. I haven't changed the notes. Um, so... I've wanted to give her the the, the best, the, 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 the maximum respect mm. in the way I've treated the reconstruction. And you know, I don't, I don't even think of it as a reconstruction. Reconstruction sounds like, you know, you come along with your building blocks and you you decide, oh, yeah, okay, we'll put one here and we'll put one there. But to me, this is more of a rediscovery. Um, it's puzzle solving, it's problem solving. So I'm provided with four parts and there are four missing parts and and and, and, and so how, how how big are the missing parts and do you did you then <laughs> did you then compose something yourself in order to bridge the parts well i wouldn't use the word compose i feel like that's way too big yeah um i don't think of myself as a composer i do think of myself as an arranger um, and I've done lots of arranging during the lockdown because I had nothing else to do. So I had plenty of practice <laughs> arranging all sorts of different stuff. Um, but when it came to this one, I, I just looked at what was there and I let, just let it grow on me. And I, I uh, in, well, consciously and unconsciously, I let the patterns take a hold on my mind. And then when I was was working out what went in the spaces, I was reusing those patterns um, as much as possible, which is what those composers did. They did a heck of a lot of, these days we call it recycling. Yes. Um, so I feel like I firstly didn't change anything that was provided at all mm -hmm. um, and just went with what was there and then tried to work out what was intended in the missing parts. So look, you know, one of the things that's super easy with this stuff is that in a Vivaldi um, work for choir and orchestra, the parts that the choir sings are almost always doubled exactly by the instrument. So they play pretty much exactly the same music. Yes. So if you've got a four-part choir and a, two violins, a viola and a cello, those four strings are h highly likely to be just playing the same music as the singers as so the singer. when you say you've got four missing parts sometimes you can just say right well that part's going to be the same i had um an alto part for, for a choral alto and i simply got the second violin to play the same music yeah. and where i had the first violin part oh wow the introduction is incredibly ornate and really virtuosic obviously nobody could sing that but once the choir comes in it becomes reasonably straightforward and then I got the soprano to just double the first violin part. Um, so I had to write a tenor part and I had to write a tenor part that could easily be doubled on the viola. Um, and, you know, it's not as difficult as it sounds. No, and, and what you're describing there, for anyone who might be familiar, and you say you're insisting this morning, Elizabeth, uh, <laughs> a count, contrapoint to, to Douglas, that it does actually sound like Vivaldi. If you're uh, familiar... Well, let people decide for Yeah, themselves. indeed. But, but if, if anyone listening is familiar with Vivaldi's sacred work, that's and his sacred music in particular, that's what you hear. You hear the, the choral parts or the, the solo singer are singing almost an identical line to what you're hearing from the cello and the violin, and they repeat themselves. They're sort of the phrases get repeated over and over, perhaps using you know different different words and seeing different parts of the sacred texts. So that's, yeah. that's oh, well, something we're one, there's one little ex 
yeah, well, there's one exception there where, I, I mean, I don't want to make it sound too easy. Mm -hmm. The spot where I got stuck, um, uh, there are six movements. So three of the movements have the choir in them and three don't. And so those, those three movements that don't have the choir, I then found myself with only two parts. And that was the first violin part, which is just gorgeous and very solistic. And the cello part, okay, so I've got a bass. And from that bass, I can work out, uh, particularly with the hints of what's going on in the first violin part, I can work out what the chord is, what the harmony is. But in those three movements where obviously there was a soloist singing, I had a lot less to go on and there was a lot more free free wheeling in terms of creating the, the solo singer's part. And um, our son Jacob came home from Switzerland. He's working as a solo um, freelance tenor and he did a course at the Scholar Cantorum in Basel where he did quite a lot of improvisation and reconstruction from early sources mm -hmm. so this was right up his alley and he was fascinated to look at what I'd done um, helped me with some proof sheets and some corrections and then he said well go on mum do the solo movements and I said oh gee I'm not sure if I can and he said of course you can it's just the same as the choral movements he said you know just work out the chord put in um, a skeleton uh, a skeleton part and then fill it out I thought <laughs> oh okay I can follow those instructions simple, what I've been doing all along but as simple I thought, as that oh, yes, I think I can do that <laughs> so with him sort of standing there and, and looking over my shoulder and telling me that it was okay I managed it <laughs> You're listening to the manager and the founder and director of the Australian Chamber Choir. They're talking about the elaborate and fascinating reconstruction process they've gone through in order to recreate, bring together the fragments of a composition that was put together by someone known as Agatha de la Pieta, who was uh, passed to the orphanage, the very famous for orphanage, the Ospedale de la Pieta in Venice back in the 1700s and who went on to become a star student of Vivaldi and others and, uh, and apparently wrote this manuscript which survives in fragments and which Elizabeth Anderson has put together. Douglas Lawrence, what does it feel like as, as director of the Australian Chamber Choir? What does it feel like to, to know that you're, you're bringing to life a composition that has not been heard, perhaps maybe not ever, but has certainly not been heard in almost 300 years from a young woman who didn't have get, go on to have a career and have a voice and have a position in the artistic firmament? Well, that's a very good question, and I would say it gives me the shivers. Um, I think the whole thing is a kind of miracle, to which we we have to for which we have to thank Elizabeth, but um, I feel humbled by it. I, I can't, I'm not a particularly humble person, but this is <laughs> an extraordinary thing, and it's a world first. So I mm -hmm. mean, you know, it's better than winning a gold medal at the Olympics. This has been take, this has taken three hundred years, and um, I'm yes, I'm, I'm I'm just staggered by the whole thing. And rehearsing it has been a joy all round. We're, we're all gobsmacked, really. Elizabeth, what is it about that place? Why did this orphanage become such a, a centre for music and important music of its time? It's a very good question, Virginia, and I don't think I'm qualified to answer it because, you know, I've really done the tiniest amount of research. I've just, you know, I've just happened upon these manuscripts and... Um, it's not as if I've been researching uh, the, the musical orphanages of Venice for a great deal of time, but somebody <laughs> well, had... Sorry, just to jump in, Elizabeth, were there more than one? There were, there were three. Um, so it was a bit of a thing. Wow. Um, and there is someone in Melbourne, a, a novelist, who has been researching the Venetian musical orphanages for at least a decade, and her name is Christine Valens, and she's just written a novella, which has won a prize, <laughs> called Water Music, which I just happened to read about in the age of a few months back. And I was so delighted to discover that she lived locally. Came for a call, we got chatting, we've got to know each other. And she's coming along to do a pre-concert talk at a quarter to two on the day um, at all the concerts. So we're really delighted to have her along and to have her be able to fill out what it was like to live in one of these orphanages as, as an orphan and to, to grow up learning music from some pretty amazing teachers.
What an extraordinary story. And, and I, I, I do remember reading about water music. Christine Ballant is, is her name. And so as, um, yeah. as Elizabeth has just said, she's going to be giving that, that pre-performance chat. Uh, but what an extraordinary coincidence that the person who has researched the book and written it <laughs> is also here in Melbourne. <laughs> Yeah, it's all the stars have aligned. I mean, this is really meant to happen <laughs> in Melbourne, uh, not in Venice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 do you know if there are any tickets available at the Scots Church to hear this inaugural performance? Yes, there are, but I would suggest strongly that people book. I think uh, it's always a good idea to know where your seat is when you arrive at the door, and we've got some uh, just a few pre premium seats left up the front, which I'm sure will get snapped up. Um, so, yeah, I would suggest that people go online and choose their seat. Getting some wonderful uh, comments as we listen to Elizabeth Anderson and Douglas Lawrence. What a great story, writes Terry. I'm happy to volunteer my services as a location sound recordist to capture this event. If there are no plans to do so currently in place, please pass my number to the guest. Do, do you need these services, uh, Douglas? Fantastic. Um, well, I'd like to talk to that person. <laughs> Douglas, yeah, you, uh, do you have... Elizabeth. Yeah, not talking to you, Douglas. Do, do you have someone booked to record it? You have to ask the manager. You know her name? <laughs> yeah, I know Elizabeth's name. <laughs> I'm just trying to share the conversation here. But <laughs> I'm sure he could answer that one. <laughs> it's being, it's being live-streamed on the day, yeah, and nice. it'll be available on demand afterwards. Um, uh, but I would like to talk to that person. Please put me in touch with him. <laughs> I, will, I will certainly do that. Um, this as well from Robert in Carlton. Superb conversation with musicians read the reconstruction of the original score. It brings tears to my eyes. So beautiful, says Robert from Carlton. So, Douglas. Yeah, me too. Yeah, Robert is just as moved <laughs> as, as you have been from all of that. Um, how's life been being able to get back in front of people after all this time in lockdown, Douglas? Well, we live streamed all the way through the COVID horror um, with four, five, six and eight people. <laughs> it depended on what was allowed that week. So <clears throat> we really didn't stop. Um, and in Scots, we kept live streaming too with, with members of the choir there. Mm. Um, well, it's very different. You lose track of time, don't you? I mean, what day is it? What month is it? Almost what year is it? But we never left lost focus and we, we were active but it was fantastic to stand in front of a group of singers and players again um, and it's all good uh, the choir survived we had enormous support from the public during the lockdown which was great and we're back going full steam ahead and I'm very happy that we did survive and that it, it looks so good for the choir what were the particular challenges for you, Elizabeth, or were you just able to, to spend all that time working away on, on reconstructing Agatha's piece? Um, I did a lot of um, arrangements for the choir during that period. Um, early on in the lockdowns, um, uh, Vera Lynn died. And yes. I remembered that, that song that she used to sing, uh, We'll Meet Again, and I thought, oh, isn't that beautiful? And it's got some very poignant text that has, that, that has a synthesis with what we're going through now. Um, and I wanted to rearrange, I wanted to arrange it for unaccompanied singers so that we could sing it as an encore. Um, I had to go through all sorts of permissions because it was owned by Sony, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, I worked through all the, the stuff you have to work through um, and then I arranged it for eight singers and we did it uh, at our next live streaming and then I think we, we were told we could only have six singers at the next one so then I rearranged it for six and then the next one we were only allowed to have so I kept on rearranging the same piece which was a great exercise. It was a great pre preparation for the reconstruction work with Agatha's Cantata. Um, and I, I rearranged all sorts of other stuff during that period too because I, you know, I had time on my hands and it was a bit like doing jigsaws, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, much, much more uh, useful uh, and, and in the end rewarding exercise I think, to do this than the, to, to do uh, jigsaw puzzles. Uh, when and where will people find it if they'd like to listen or even see the live stream? Um, we've built our own live streaming platform and it's super easy to book and get into and get your access. 
Um, if you choose, you can um, pay a little bit more and get three concerts um, for a little bit less. And uh, we call it ACCESS. That stands for the Australian Chamber Choir's Excellent Streaming Service. <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, you just uh, you can get just punch it straight into your um, search engine. Yes. You do it access.ozchoir.org or you can just access it via our website, Australian Chamber Choir. Well, we wish you all the very best for it. Uh, it does sound like Thanks, it's going you. to be a, a landmark, an amazing performance and something of which you should all be very proud. Elizabeth and Douglas, great to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you Thanks so, much. so much for having us. Elizabeth Anderson, the manager of the Australian Chamber Choir, and Douglas Lawrence, who's the founder and director of the choir. And that cantata is being performed on May 7 at the Scots Church.